Hello everybody. Welcome once again to Takuma Island Online. We are glad that you're here today. Yes, yes. And today we're going to talk about God's promises. That's right. And the amazing love that God has for us. Yes. So we're going to talk about the story of Peter, how Peter denied Jesus three times and before Jesus was crucified. And, and it was just hard for him because the last thing Jesus saw him doing was denying him with right, the right. cross. And so uh, we're going to find out. Jesus comes back and specifically comes to Peter, and he gives him an opportunity to do something short. Right. So right. I, I'm looking forward to that. And show his love towards him. Yeah, because Jesus basically was telling Peter, I'm not mad at you, or, you know, but I still love you. Even though you messed up, I still love you deeply. Like our parents do to us sometimes, you know. So anyway. Yeah, because God loves us with an unconditional love. There's nothing we can do that would make Him stop loving us. So. Right. Well, let's get on with our program. We'll catch you back. I think we should do that. Yes. See you at the end. You have any idea what this is? 
This is kind of interesting. It's called a record. Now, this thing is old. It's been around for a long time, for a good number of years. And the way this thing is designed, it's actually kind of the, the forerunner of CDs and uh, that kind of thing because this is what you would use to play music. Back before CDs and cassettes and that kind of stuff were, were invented. And so, if you can, you know, it's hard to see, but uh, if you look at it, there is a, it's made out of vinyl, but there's a groove that goes around, but it's in a spiral pattern. So it's a groove that goes on, but it keeps working its way closer and closer and closer to the center. And so the way this thing is work, would work is you had a machine called a record player. It would have a spindle that would go up, and you'd put this on it. It would drop down. There'd be a table that it would sit on, but the table would spin. Now this is called a 45 because it would spin at 45 rounds per minute. Uh, there are records, bigger ones would spin at 33 rounds a minute, and there were smaller ones than this that would go at 78 rounds a minute. And so the, the size of the record was, you know, was called by the amount of times it spun around. And so you put it on the, the table, it would spin around, and you adjust the table to the right speed, you'd put a needle down on top of it. The needle would be on an arm, it would come down, and it would settle down into the groove. And so because the record was spinning, and the groove was spiraling in, it would move the needle across that record all the way to the end. But as it ran through that groove, it would play music. Or if somebody was talking, it would you know, play what they were talking. If it was a song, people singing, that kind of thing. So this is how you would get your music years ago. Now, it was good, but there are some problems with this. They oftentimes got dusty. And you can see this one's got even dust on it. The dust would kind of settle down in the grooves. And so as that needle would run through it, it would kind of go through the dust and would pick up extra noise. So it'd be kind of snaps and crackles. And, and so you didn't get a pure sound out of the record. But also, uh, they were kind of fragile. This one here, it's got a crack in it. So they would break easy. And if you had a crank in it, then as the needle would spin around, when it would hit that crack, it would kind of jump and come back down on the record again. So you would not get a nice, even sound. What you put on this record is what you would get off of it. But because of some of the imperfections and stuff, what you got off was not as clear as what you put in on it. Now, there's an interesting verse in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7. It says, as a person thinks in their heart, so are they. So in other words, what you put inside of you, what you take in through your mind, through your thinking, through your eyes, what you listen to, what you pay attention to, what you think about, what you allow your mind to dwell on, whatever that is that you do on a regular basis, at some point it's going to come out in your actions. If you spend time thinking about good things, about godly things, and you're listening to godly music, and, and you're talking about godly things, and you're spending time reading the Bible, what's going to come out of you is godly thoughts and ideas. But if you spend time ignoring God, you spend time looking at things that you shouldn't be looking at, um, thinking about things you shouldn't be thinking about, that's what's going to be coming out of you. So, the more time you spend talking with God, reading His Word, spending time with other Christians, other believers, the closer God's going to get to you. The Bible says if you draw near to God, He'll draw near to you. And as you spend time doing those things, drawing near to God, He's going to draw near to you. And when you have a problem or a difficulty in your life, He's going to be right there to help you with that problem, to give you His peace, to give you His comfort, and to help you walk you through whatever that is. One of the names in the Bible that we have that God gave about himself is he is called the God of all comfort. And when you're going through a difficult time, he is there to help comfort you and to walk you through it. In fact, the Holy Spirit, one of his names is he's called the comforter. Someone who is called alongside to help as you're going through your life. So what it comes down to is what do you allow your mind to focus on? 
Are you focusing on things that are good and right and honest and godly? If so, that's what's going to be coming out of your life. Or are you focusing on things that are not so good, that are not godly, that are not upright and pure? The challenge is, will you make sure this week that you spend time thinking about the things that are right? And as you're doing that, draw closer to God. boys and girls how are you um i thought we'd do something kind of cool today and um i'm gonna make a paper airplane many of you may have already made paper airplanes many of you may know how to make a paper airplane there's a lot of different ways that you can make paper airplanes and they all can look like fairly the same but like a little bit different so if you want to have some fun with this you can make a paper airplane um at some point in time and you can think about today's object lesson when you make it so um, how many of you ever been on an airplane how many of you ever ridden on an airplane I've ridden on an airplane before I went to Montana on an airplane I went to Colorado on an airplane I went to Texas on an airplane I went to Florida on an airplane hey I just thought wouldn't it be cool if we can go to heaven on an airplane do you think we can go to heaven on an airplane yeah, there's my airplane. Think I can go to heaven on an airplane? Yeah, I don't think I can go to heaven on an airplane. You know, your parents can buy you tickets to go to on an airplane. You can fly a lot of different places on an airplane, but you can't go to heaven on an airplane. Wait a minute. What is heaven? Heaven is where God lives, and heaven is a place where God wants us to go and to live with him forever and ever when our body dies here he wants us to be with him in heaven our soul forever so we can't get there in an airplane airplanes just don't go high enough they don't go far enough doesn't work um you know i've been hearing on the radio and on the tv that a lot of people can now go into space like uh millionaires on earth like it used to be just astronauts but now it's like millionaires and like they can go uh, into space on a rocket. So if you have a lot of money, you can buy a ticket to go on a rocket ship. Do you think a rocket can get you to heaven? That'd be pretty cool. Rockets do go higher and they orbit around the earth. So they go higher than an airplane, but they don't get far enough to go to heaven either. You know, as a matter of fact, there really is nothing that you or I can do to go to heaven but there is something God can do and wait a minute hold on why can't you and I do anything to go to heaven because God wants us to be there and he wants us to live with him forever but we're separated from him because of sin everybody sins you've sinned I've sinned sins can be as simple as thinking a bad thought about a kid that you don't like um, sneaking a cookie when mom takes them out of the oven and says, don't eat them until after dinner, save them for dessert. Um, it could be as you walk by somebody, you like push their stuff on the floor, you know, and, and don't apologize. But it can be big things too, you know, like, um, you know, stealing something, um, you know, murder, you know, like, um, uh, um, just, you know, there's a lot of things that we do that just aren't pleasing to God and their sins. Okay, so our sin separates us from God. Now, we can't fix that. We can try and we can live our lives to the best of our ability and follow God, but we will always have that sin nature and we will always sin. So we can't do anything to get to heaven, but God can. You know, we can't ride an airplane. We can't ride on a rocket ship. As a matter of fact, God has already done something to get us to go to heaven with him. He sent his son, Jesus, down here on earth. Now, Jesus was fully God and fully man. Remember I said that we all have that sin nature? When Jesus was here, he was perfect on earth. He never sinned because he was still fully God. So, he never sinned. He was perfect, but he allowed people human beings like you and me to 
sinned against him. And they took him and they nailed him to a cross. And he died. But when he died, he paid that price for our sin. He gave that blood sacrifice. He was separated from God when he died on that cross. And he paid that price for our sin. So, look at this. God sent Jesus to pay that price for our sin on the cross. So, we can't use a paper airplane. We can't use a real airplane. We can't use a rocket ship. But we can use the cross to get to heaven to be with Jesus. Now, how would that work, you think? Well, if you admit that you sinned and you believe that Jesus died on that cross to pay that price for our sin and you ask him to come into your heart, you have that ticket to get to heaven. You don't have to buy a ticket on an airplane. You don't have to buy a ticket on a rocket ship. You have to believe that Jesus was your savior. And that's your ticket to heaven. You can ride to heaven on the cross. So my question to you is, are you going to choose to have Jesus as your Savior and buy that ticket to heaven? Or are you still going to try to get there in an airplane or a rocket ship? Have a good week. <laughs>Your boat could get caught in the current and be... Uh-oh. Swept downstream! Oh, no! There it goes! I better jump in and get it! Wait, Herb. It's already in the deep part of the creek. You know you can't go in there. Besides, it's going so fast now, you'd never catch it. You're right. Oh, now I'll never see it again. Oh, my little boat is gone forever. <laughs> Walk around town was a good idea, Skip. It helped me forget my troubles. Yeah, and it gave me time to dry out. I sure like it here in the secondhand junk store. There sure is a lot of neat stuff. I wonder if that old electric razor still works. What's it matter to you? You don't shave. Yeah, but Priscilla's cat gets so hot in the summertime, I thought maybe uh, I could... Hi there, boys. See anything you like? These are all really good buys. I let you have anything you like real cheap. Now, here's something you might be interested in. I picked it up down by the creek bank this morning. That's my boat. Thanks for finding it for me, mister. Yeah, Herb made that boat all by himself. Hold on a minute, boys. I make my living selling things that I find. I found this boat, so now it belongs to me. I'll tell you what. You can take it off my hands for, uh, how much you got on you? Two dollars. But it's mine. I made it with my own hands. Why should I have to pay for something that already belongs to me? Two bucks will get it back. Take it or leave it. Okay, it's a deal. Here's your two dollars. Please give me my boat. I'm so glad to have my little boat back. You're mine twice, little boat. I made you, and now I've bought you, so you're mine twice. Hey, that reminds me of God's love. It does? How? Well... First, God made people just like you made your boat. Then, after they were lost, God bought them back. Yeah, he did. And he paid lots more than just money. He paid with the life of his son on the cross so everyone could be his again. 
Not only do Christians belong to God, they belong to Him twice, just like your boat. Want to go sail it again? Sure, but first, I'm going to stop at home and get some string. Twice is enough. I don't need to own this boat three times. Hey, get some string for me, too. I'll tie it around my waist so you can keep me from falling in the creek again. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Tie the other end like to go fishing. Now, I want to share something with you about a story from the Bible where some guys went fishing, but their fishing trip wasn't really very successful, at least not in the beginning. And today I'm going to read to you from John chapter 21. It says, After this, Jesus appeared again to the disciples at the Sea of Galilee. So Jesus had already died and risen back to life. And now he was coming to appear to the disciples once again. It says, this is how he did it. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Cana, the brother Zebedee and two other disciples were together. Simon Peter announced, I'm going fishing. The rest of them replied, we're going with you. They went out and got in the boat. They caught nothing that night. Now think about that. I don't think you've ever gone fishing and not caught anything. I have to say, I'm not a fan of fishing, and maybe it's because I've never caught any fish, but can you imagine being out all night fishing with a net and not being able to catch any fish? It says, when the sun came up, Jesus was standing on the beach, but they didn't recognize him. They didn't know who it was. So Jesus is on the beach, and he says to him, Hey, good morning. Did you catch anything for breakfast? They all said, Nah. He says, Throw the net off the right side of the boat and see what happens. Now, I'm thinking, they don't know that this is Jesus. And even if they did, it's kind of strange when somebody says to you, You've been fishing all night. And they said, just put the net on the other side of the boat and you'll catch some fish. But they did what he said. And it says, all of a sudden there were so many fish in, in it, in the net, that they weren't strong enough to pull it in. Can you imagine? The net is so full of fish that they can't pull it into the boat. Now that's a lot of fish, isn't it? Now, I just picture Jesus directing all those fish right into that net. Pretty amazing. And then, it says, the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Master! So, John realizes that it's Jesus on the, on the shore. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him and jumped into the water. He wanted to get to Jesus as fast as he could. It says, the other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish. For they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. Now think about that. Peter was so anxious. Now think about it. Peter was the one who had denied Jesus before he died, hadn't he? But right now he was so anxious to get to Jesus and talk to him that he jumped in the water to swim to shore to get there. It says, when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Now think about it. Jesus had already made breakfast for them. He already had fish. He already had bread. He was ready for them. He wanted them to come and share a meal with them. How cool is that? But he says to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Peter climbs back into the boat and drags the net ashore, helps to drag the net ashore. It was full of large fish. 153 big fish. That's a lot of fish. Even with so many, the net was not torn. I don't know how much weight that is in fish, but 153 fish, even it says they were large fish. So that means they weren't like little tiny one pound fish. They were good sized fish. 
but the net did not break. It wasn't torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. And none of them dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was Jesus. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. Now, this was the third time that Jesus had appeared to the disciples after he had come back from the dead. So Jesus came to the disciples several times after he rose from the dead. I think that had to be very reassuring for them to know that Jesus was alive and well. That what he had told them was true and that they could share the gospel with the other people around them because they'd be encouraged by what Jesus did. Now, at the next section it says, When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Now in this instance, Jesus was saying to Peter, do you love me with God's love? Do you have that special love for me? But when, Jesus, when Peter responds, his is more of that brotherly love back to him. So again, Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter answers, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Two times he's asked him now. Jesus says, take care of my sheep. Both of those times, Jesus asked him if he had God's love for him, that agape love. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. So the third time, Jesus actually used the phileo kind of love, the brotherly love, because he knew that Peter had that brotherly love for him. But I find it very interesting. Remember at the beginning I said that back before Jesus died, Peter had denied him how many times? That's right, three times. How many times does Jesus ask him if he loves him? Three times. Peter has a chance to tell Jesus how much he loves him. And every time he answers, yes, I have that brotherly love for you. Now, Jesus also said to him, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. So Jesus knew how Peter was going to die. And he kind of gave him a little bit of an indication of what was going to happen. But then he said, follow me. Right then, he wanted Peter to concentrate on following him. Now, what happened next I find quite interesting, because it says, Turning his head, Peter noticed the disciple Jesus loved following right behind. When Peter noticed him, he asked Jesus, Master, what's going to happen to him? Now, never worry about those people around you, what's going to happen. Am I the most important? What's going to go on? Jesus said, if I want him to live until I come again, what's that to you? You follow me. And that kind of started a rumor that that disciple wouldn't die. But that's not what Jesus had said. He just simply said, if I wanted him to live until I come again, what's that to you? Basically, don't worry about other people. Worry about yourself. Sometimes we get too wrapped up and what's happening with other people, and what's going on in other people's lives. And we forget to keep our eyes on Jesus and to just follow Him. Now, as, as this chapter closes, I find it kind of interesting because it says, This is the same disciple who was eyewitness to all these things and wrote them down. And we all know that his eyewitness account is reliable and accurate. So, the disciple that Jesus loved was John. John recorded all this information for us. John wanted us to know all these things. 
He shared all these things with us so that we could know about Jesus and his love for us. And today I want to leave you with the thought. You need to hold on to God's promises. The promises God has given you, he's going to keep them. Just like he wanted Peter to follow him, to keep his eyes on him. Not focus on those other people around him, but keep his eyes on Jesus. He wants us to keep his eyes on him as well. He wants us to realize that God keeps his promises. So, even if you're sad or sorrowful, remember Jesus always keeps his promises. In fact, he tells us that he will keep his promises and he'll work everything out for our good and for his glory. Now, I want you to think about the whole story today, the whole picture. If there's any part of it that you could relate to, think about something in your life that Jesus has done for you. Most important thing he's done for you is die on the cross and raise again so that you can have your sins forgiven. But think about the little things that he does that he shows his love and his promise for you every day. And just look at those things and thank God for what he does for you every day. Because God's promises are true and he will always keep his word. here um there's a verse in the bible from james chapter 4 verse 10 that says if you humble yourself in the sight of the lord he will lift you up at the right time so that's a pretty um heavy verse and some vocabulary that we have to learn first of all humble yourself what does it mean to humble yourself if you humble yourself you put god and others first ahead of what you want to do so you do what god wants you to do Pray, read the Bible, you know, talk to others about him and what others want you to do before things that you want to do. And you do those things when you humble yourself, you do those things, even if you really don't want to do them, um, even if you don't feel like it at the time. And when you humble yourself, God promises to honor you and lift you up. So what does that mean to lift you up? Um, God will reward you and God will make things better for you, lift you up. So I'm going to do a little experiment to kind of illustrate this. So I have a jar and I have um, a piece of paper and I have a plate here um, with just with a paper towel on it. And hmm, my goal is to lift the plate with this glass jar. That's not going to work that way. So let's try something different here. Got another piece of paper, gonna crumple it up a little bit. And got my aim and flame. So I'm going to light it on fire and get it going pretty good. Jab it down in that jar. It's still going. Flip it over on there. Uh, look at that. I was able to pick up the plate with the jar. Now, when I first flipped it over, that paper was still on fire. But when I put the jar down on the paper towel on the plate, it cut off all the oxygen. It used up the oxygen that was in there and it created like a vacuum seal and it, the fire went out. So this kind of shows that when you humble yourself, you can be lifted up because when you humble yourself, a lot of times you have to stop what you're doing, set aside what you're doing, and do what God wants you to do and what others want you to do. So it's kind of like that flame going out. And then if you keep doing that, if you put aside what you want to do, if you put aside what, um, you, you know, your desires and you do what God wants you to do and what others want you to do, even if it's something you really don't want to do, God will notice that every time because he's watching you all the time. He will notice and he'll keep track and he'll, he'll store up all of those times that you humble yourself 
and he will reward you at the right time. It may not be right away, it may not be the same day, it may not be the same week, it may not be the same month, it may not be in this year. But God is watching and he sees when you humble yourself and when you put him first and when you put others first. And he will reward you. And when he does reward you, when it is that right time, that reward is going to be so well worth it. It's going to be better than anything you could ever imagine. So my challenge to you this week is, are you going to humble yourself and put others first and put God first? Or are you going to be a little self-centered and do what you want to do? So I'm going to choose to try to find an extra way that I can put somebody else first and to put God first and to do things that God wants me to do and that others might want me to do before something that I want to do. So that's my challenge to you. Can you humble yourself this week? Because God's watching and the reward will definitely be worth it. Take care. Have a good one. Well, here we are at the end of another Tacoma Island yeah, Hotline. These things just kind of fly right by. And, and here we are at the end of February. Yeah, We're already going to be, out, be right? into March next week. Spring so. is, is around the corner. Yes, time is just flying by. Yes. But we're glad you guys are joining us online. We hope soon, maybe with the nicer weather and everything, yeah. you guys will come out and join us here in person yeah, at Tacoma awesome. Island. Yes. We're starting to get back to some of our pre-COVID activities. Yeah. And, and it's really been a lot of fun. We're doing some crafts and doing some games. Yeah, sure. And so it's a lot, lot more like the normal normal to Kuma. So yes, and the we, science movements are so much better in person than, yes, than online. Yes. So we really hope that you'll come and join us yes. soon. But we're glad you joined us online. Yes. And we hope you have a great week. Take care. Stay safe. Stay well. Bye-bye. Take care.